uh, from Sasima. And uh, this is the faculty lecture. And it's uh, entitled Seduction by Correlation, a Cautionary Tale. And it involves uh, looking at the idea of apparent negative density dependent dispersal in tsetse flies, which um, I call apparent because uh, I and my co-authors co think that it's an artifact of inappropriate analysis. I'm in this uh, work joined by uh, Glenn Vale, with whom I've worked for many decades, and John Van Sickle, that, that I've known since the 1980s, and Eric Lucas uh, from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, that I've met more lately. The goals of this uh, talk are to warn against uh, being seduced by R squared, by large values of R squared. Um, to warn against being baffled by complexity, to warn against confusing correlation and causation, and more generally, um, to caution that things are not always as they seem, and also to encourage you to use your common sense, to encourage you particularly to dissect data very carefully, and finally, to encourage tenacity and stubbornness in your approach to research. I particularly highlight the idea of data because that's what is data is all about, and will be this will be a, a central part of what I'll be talking about. Data is the beginning, the middle, and the end of everything that we do. So this lecture serves mainly to warn that one needs to take great care in the analysis and particularly in the interpretation of data. Neither the particular study that I'm going to use as an example, nor the particular animal used in the study are really of great importance in the story we're going to tell. The important thing is the data and how those data were and are and should be interpreted. As it happens, the data relate to tsetse flies, insects that are found in the wild, only in Africa. There, it's an important insect. Uh, they occur over about 11 million square kilometers of Africa still. They transmit trypanosomiasis, <clears throat> which is a serious problem in East and Southern Africa uh, for veterinary in the veterinary world, and still is a problem for human beings, human sleeping sickness, um, still a problem in parts of West and Central Africa. Now, the tsetse fly is a very, very unusual animal. Here we see, and this is the start of life, or a larva which is being deposited by its mother. And this larva is absolutely huge. In fact, the larva can weigh as much as or even more than its mother. So that's the beginning of life. Here is, we see this white blob here is, is a larva, very, very large. And what happens with that larva is it simply burrows under the, under the ground and forms around itself a hard puperial case, uh, which eventually becomes black. And it sits under the ground for a long time and uh, it emerges uh, ultimately from that preperial case as this, the adult tsetse fly. So it's a very unusual uh, life cycle. So here we have it, a single larva develops inside the mother. The larva uh, gets deposited on the ground and buries itself under the ground, stays under the ground for 20 to 40 days, depending on the temperature, and then emerges. And uh, eight days or so later, it, it ovulates and then the life cycle is uh, completed. Now, tsetse flies live on blood, blood, and only blood. Um, and a, when they take a single blood meal like this fly, which is just taken one, <clears throat> that meal can weigh three times the, the fly's body weight. So this is pretty amazing. So in a lot of ways, tsetse flies are very unusual insects. Um, as we've said, they don't lay large numbers of eggs. They're not like mosquitoes, house flies, um, horse flies. They don't lay a lot of eggs. Instead, they produce a single larva every eight to 12 days, depending on the temperature. Uh, that larva, as I've said, uh, when, it, when as it's born, it weighs as much or more than the mother that's just actually deposited it. And the, the important thing about this larva is it doesn't need to feed. When a a mosquito lays eggs on a water body, those eggs hatch, and then the larvae have to go and fend for themselves. They've got to find all of the, the food, the nutrition, the energy to sustain them through the pupil period. Not so for the tsetse fly larva. The tsetse fly larva is given by its mother 
all of the energy and all of the raw materials it requires to form the pupa and to sit inside the puparial case and undergo the uh, order of metamorphosis and give rise to a full-sized adult fly. So it really is very unusual. That metamorphosis, as I've said, can take 20 to 50 days, depending on temperature. And as I've also said, the sexes uh, live solely on blood, both sexes, both males and females. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, given that they have to be able to lug around this huge larva and also a very, very big blood meal, and sometimes both, sometimes with a large larva and a large uh, blood meal, uh, tsetse flies are very strong flyers. But uh, they don't actually fly for very long distances and nor for very long durations. Generally, their flights uh, last for only maybe uh, a minute or two minutes at a time, and they may make those flights only five or 10 maximum times per day. So they don't go for very terribly long distances. And mark recapture studies suggest that dispersal rates are of the order only of about 150 to 800 meters per day, depending on the sex and the species. Now, I mentioned mark recapture, so how would we know how far a fly goes? Well, one of the ways to do it is to actually put a little dot of, of uh, artist's oil paint on the thoracic surface of the fly, uh, the color and the position of the dot indicating where and when the fly was released. Then you let the fly go and you run sampling efforts over the next few days and weeks and you get recaptures of all of the flies that you've marked and you find out where they were recaptured. And from that, you can tell the rate and the pattern of movement. And that's basically how these estimates of 150 to 800 meters per day were uh, achieved. It's not the only way of doing it. And a different way of doing it is actually to look at uh, genetic analysis. So in this uh, graph, for instance, what we basically got here is each dot here uh, represents the, uh, the relationship between two subpopulations of a population of tsetse fly. And for a given point, the one that I'm highlighting here, for instance, what this would basically say is uh, this: these two subpopulations are uh, between 4.5 and, and 5.5 uh, log, natural log units apart. That's to say it's somewhere in the region of 100 kilometers. And what you do is to look at the genetic difference between uh, the, those two flies from those two subpopulations, and you get a measure of that. Now, clearly, what should be true is as you go further and further away, the genetic distance should uh, increase. But the rate at which that increases is going to, is going to depend also on delta, the, um, the rate of, of dispersal of those flies. So the higher the rate at which the, uh, the animal population, the tsetse fly population disperses, the greater will be the genetic mixing, and the smaller will be the genetic differences between widely separated populations. And that means that the slope of this, of this graph here, which is we call B, is going to be um, flatter and flatter as the flies move more and more rapidly. So we can get, you can see that we can have some sort of way of measuring the rate at which uh, flies are dispersing by looking at the slope of B uh, in populations, subpopulations of A populations of tsetse. And this is exactly what has been done by uh, Demaeus et al. in a paper published in 2019 where they used the theoretical development uh, of Rousset from 1997 to suggest a way in which this dispersal distance delta could indeed be estimated from measures of B and of the effective population density DE. So we're going to be interested in these three parameters, delta, B, and DE. And we're going to be interested also, in fact, breaking down DE, which is the effective population density, that is going to be, uh, it is formed as the ratio of the effective population size divided by, uh, obviously, the area which that population occupies. So DE is equal to NE over S. And if we put that in here, we then can look at um, the delta expressed as a uh, function of S, the area, B, the slope of the graph, and NE, the effective population. Now, the effective population is rather a complicated uh, thing to understand, 
but roughly it's defined as the number of adults in a population that will leave a genetic signature to the next generation. Very, very roughly, it is rather a rough way of putting it, it's basically the, the population that's breeding. So uh, members of the population are too old that don't leave any, any uh, signature in the next population, they're not counted. So in general, NE will be smaller than the census population, NC, which we'll see later. And S is the surface area occupied by the affected population. And what Demeas et al. did was to study the relationship between dispersal rates and population densities in various tsetse populations. And what they did was to look at 10 studies, the books, 10 studies from around Africa, five different species of, of tsetse flies collected in six different African countries. And for each one of those uh, studies, uh, what they did was to measure delta and they measured B and then they estimated B, uh, D, E, the effective population density. And then they plotted a graph of the dispersal distance per generation. So this is delta up here against the effective population density. So this is D, E over here, log D, E, and this is basically, this is log delta. And what they found was a very, very strong negative correlation between delta and D, E on log scales which had a slope, uh, which is up in the exponent over here, of quite close to uh, minus 0 0.5. So what this basically says is, if we believe this correlation, is that as the population density increases, the flies move more, disperse more and more slowly. Or looked at the other way, if we reduce the population, then the flies move more and more rapidly. Now, this is quite an interesting thing to say, and what Demeas uh, et al. Claim, uh, claim from this is that when you have control campaigns, which are going to really reduce your population down to this very low, low population densities, then this is going to unleash enhanced dispersal from untreated areas, because when you've got low population densities, flies are going to move much more rapidly. Now they uh, found this for they found this very strong correlation here, uh, both if they plotted the uh, de delta against the effective population density, or if they plotted it against the census population density, which they basically got from the number of flies that they caught per trap per unit time. So both of them give a very strong and much the same uh, R squared and much the same. Uh, value of the exponent, which is of the order of minus uh, 0 0.5. Okay. Now, what do these graphs show and what do they not show? If you take them at face value, the evidence appears to be extremely strong. If you've got an R squared value of 0 0.85, it seems incontrovertible that as population density increases, rates of dispersal decrease. Hard to argue with such hard, high values of R squared, isn't it? And indeed, if this is true, it would be a very exciting and a very interesting res result. However, it is completely counterintuitive. What we expect is that as populations get more crowded, there's going to be competition for resources. And you would expect under those circumstances that animals would tend to move more rapidly and, and get away from the competition. So you would expect to see that as population densities go up, you would see increased rather than decreased rates of dispersal. That's to say, we might expect to see positive density dependent dispersal rather than negative. And indeed, for other insects, it would appear that positive density dependent dispersal seems to be the norm in insect populations. It doesn't stop there because even if it's true that there is this very high correlation, Demas et al. are claiming more than that. They're not just saying that there's a correlation. They say that there is causation involved, and they're basically saying that it's the, in, the decreased population density which is, is resulting in the increased population move, movements. But is it that way around? Even if there is actually causation involved, is it that population causes, increase causes the change in, um, in the rates of movement, or is it that the rates of movement actually cause the, the, the changes in population density? Or indeed, is it in fact that population density and, pop and dispersal rates are actually both independently impacted by some other factor entirely? In other words, is there some manner of confounding? Well, let's look at another example. For instance, let's have a look 
at the pigeons of Trafalgar Square. If you've ever been to London, um, I'm not sure if there's, there's still quite as many as there used to be, but this is a common scene of these thousands and thousands of pigeons sitting in Trafalgar Square. Now, then you, you can see no flapping birds around there. Nobody, no birds are going anywhere. So is the, this, this very low rate of dispersal caused by this very high density of pigeons? Or is the high density of pigeons caused by the low rate of dispersal? Or is, in fact, there, is there something else going on? Well, let's look at another picture. So if we look at this picture here, what we see is somebody selling pigeon food, people buying it and feeding the pigeons. So of course, this is absolutely a wonderful place for the pigeons to be. And this suggests what we've got is confounding. People are feeding the birds are causing the increased densities of the pigeons. They're also causing the decreased uh, population dispersal rates. So in this particular case, there's no reason to suggest a causative link between population density and population dispersal rates. But let's go back to the tsetse. So in this case too, we're going to argue that there is actually no causation involved at all, and that even the very high correlations are themselves artifacts of inappropriate analysis. So we don't even think there's any confounding involved. It's actually about this, so we're going to look at this. Now, recall the equations used to generate these graphs, where you've got delta is basically given by the inverse uh, of the square root of pi times b times de. And if we uh, break down de, then it's basically that's the same as uh, delta is the square root of s over the square root of pi times b times ne. And what we're going to do specifically is to put a spotlight on s the area occupied by the subpopulation. And how did uh, Demaeus et al. estimate S? Well, we know exactly how they did it because they tell us. And they basically are, are saying that the average surface S occupied by a subpopulation can be computed as the surface area occupied by the different traps used in the given survey site. When only one trap is available per site, we, uh, per site we computed S equals pi times L min over two squared, where L min is the distance between the two closest sites taken as the distance between the centers of two neighboring subpopulations. So let's actually just quickly flick to the next slide and then come back here just so we can see what's going on. So here is a, a typical Tetsi trap. Flies come in at the bottom here and they get caught up in this uh, bottle up over here. And we put a trap at this center here, and we put another trap over here. And this, uh, the distance between these two traps, let's say we've got a whole lot of these traps, but this is the smallest distance between two traps is L min. And we then form these two circles, and this basically gives the area of the subpopulation for each of these, uh, each such subpopulation. So that's what how you get this value of S. But Basically, what they are assuming is there is an equivalence of the area occupied by the subpopulation and the area which is uh, occupied by this trap. And this basically is the fatal error. Because when we go back here and look at this, what, this, what we're actually doing, you recall what we're actually doing with these traps. We're catching flies from a, from a, a, a trap here, and we're doing the genetic analysis of these flies, and we're getting some sort of idea about from the genetic analysis about NE, the effective population size. Now the trouble is this: as we, if we take these these traps and actually move them further apart, what's going to happen? Well, clearly, what is going to happen is L min is going to increase, and the surface uh, the surface area S occupied by the subpopulation is going to increase as the square of L min. Right. The trouble is that the uh, the number of flies we're going to catch when these flies are anything more than 100 meters apart is actually not going to change. We're not going to catch any more flies when we actually move these fly the, the, uh, these traps two kilometers apart as opposed to one kilometer apart. So what is going to happen is that uh, for over quite a large range, at any rate, NE is not actually going to change. S is going to get bigger. NE is not going to change, and that means that DE is going to get smaller. And when you, if we look back at the e equation, which I'm not going to do right now, but basically what that mean is, means is that delta is going to increase. 
In other words, what is going to happen is that the value of delta that we measure is going to depend on how we put our traps out. And this clearly is really not a very good idea. And what is going to happen is we get the appearance of negative dependent density dispersal simply through errors in the estimates of DE, which arise chiefly through errors in the estimates of S. Well, uh, this is a slightly complicated argument, um, but I think you can see basically where it's going. But let's actually look at a, a simulation program, which is written by Eric Lucas and uh, works in, in Excel, where we're actually going to check this. And the way that we're going to check it is basically by setting up, we're in control of this population. This is entirely a simulated population, and we get to decide how this population behaves. And what we're going to say is we're going to have a, a whole lot of little populations uh, where we are going to have different values of DE, but we are going to insist that in, in this population that delta is the same, regardless of DE, okay? So in other words, it doesn't matter how, how the, the effective population density changes, delta is going to be the same. So if we plotted log delta against log D, E, for instance, it would simply be a horizontal um, straight line. Right. So we do that. We pick up a, a, an arbitrary a bunch of values of, of DE. We know that, uh, that delta is, is constant. Let's say we just put it at one kilometer per, per generation. And because we, we know what uh, delta is, we know what the, each of the DEs, what we can do is calculate B or the situation where DE is measured without error. Now, if we do that, what we find is that B, log B, actually falls off against log uh, DE in this, in this manner. In other words, there's a power, power function and the slope, you may not be surprised to hear, is minus 0.5. Now that's all very, that's good and fine. That's in the situation where there is no error in DE. Now, however, let's look at this uh, graph in the center here, where we're actually saying, all right, now we're taking each one of these DE values. We were saying, let's suppose there's some stochastic error in there. And we're going to introduce this error into DE by multiplying each value of, of DE, the true value of DE, by a random factor between 0 0.2 and 5. So that either DE will get smaller or it'll get bigger by some random amount. And what we find when we do that, and we go back and play the same game, and we calculate um, the values of uh, DE and of B, we find, find now that, hallelujah, log B is actually independent of log DE, right? And then when we now go and calculate delta, what we find is, Robert Dick to that log delta falls off with log DE with a slope of minus, zero, uh, minus 0 0.5 and with a very high value of R squared. You see, in fact, it's even higher than in the, uh, in the field results. It's up to uh, 0 0.98. In other words, what we've got here is a situation where we it appear to have negative density dependent dispersal in a simulated population where we know, because we have stipulated it, that the dispersal rate is independent of density. So it just uh, looks like uh, NDDD can be an entire artifact just as a consequence of errors in the measurement of DE. And basically what that, where that is coming from is the uh, errors in the measurement of S. Now, notice that because this is a stochastic simulation, each run or realization of the model gives slightly different outcomes. But as we can see in the next slide, what we will find when we do a number of these runs, that it's in general true that log B and log DE are generally uncorrelated, and that there is a strong negative correlation between log uh, delta and log DE, and that the slope of this graph is always close to minus 0 0.5. So each we've got six uh, sets of graphs here. Uh, which are each one is a realization of the things that go on one, two, three, four, five, six. And what we see is uh, we've always got the, of course, uh, the, the graph of log DE against log B is always the same because log DE is uh, that's measured without error. But when we put error in here, then this looks slightly different from that. That looks slightly different. They all look slightly different, but it doesn't make any difference. What you always get is a very strong. Uh, negative correlation between log delta and log DE with a very high R squared. 
Okay, so it, it, it happens all the time, right? Now then, what we did it was we looked at one situation for where which happened in some of these studies, which was used by Demas et al, where there was one site, uh, sorry, one trap uh, at each site, and a large number of different sites. But there were other studies in which there were actually more. There was more than one trap used at each site. And this is, uh, if I look at this here, we look at this example. What we've got here is a situation where we've got a circle uh, of um, radius r. Let's say r might be a, a kilometer or might be only 100, 100 meters. You, you can choose. And on that circle, we've got five equally uh, equidistantly um, distributed traps and another one in the center. So we've got six traps here. I've, uh, you'll see later whether I've, I've shown some of them in gray, some of them in red, but we've got these six sites. And um, under those circumstances where you've got six, you've got a more than one trap and you know where those traps are, then what Demeyer said I'll say is that now the surface area of the site was computed as S equals pi times L max uh, squared, where L max is the distance between the two most distant traps in a given site taken as the radius of the corresponding subpopulation. Right, so what have we got here? If you actually put these uh, traps at the equidistant distances around the circumference, then you can easily see that L max is the, the distance between that trap and that trap, or indeed that and that, or that and that, and so on. And then what we do is the, we can then get S, and you take that L max, take from the center there, and this will give you the value of S, okay. And um, this is a, a one particular example where was R was set to be 100 meters. Now, you can see that there's going to be the same sort of problem here as we had in the, in the situation where we only had one uh, trap uh, per site. Because if we increase the value of R, then these traps are going to be further and further apart, and S is going to get bigger. But as long as these traps are more than about 100 meters a, a, apart from each other, we know from other studies that basically they all catch the they catch the same number of flies. So it doesn't matter whether R is equal to 100 meters or uh, a, a whole kilometer. Each one of these traps will catch catch the same number of flies. And so once again, is basically what's going to happen is both the census population and also the affected population. Uh, size are, are going to be appear to be the same regardless of how we uh, change R as long as R is more than about 100 meters. Okay. So now what uh, De Meyer et al did when they formed, for instance, the uh, the the, uh, the census population, the, they got that by simply saying how many flies were caught in total in these six traps uh, over a particular period of time, let's say three days or something like that. Now, uh, the trouble is when we increase uh, the value of R and therefore the value of, of L max, what's going to happen is that NC is going to stay exactly the same and S is going to increase. So basically what's going to happen is as with, with DE, EC is going to uh, decline. So we're going to have uh, an entirely bogus uh, measure of the, uh, of, uh, the census population density on the second graph of the mass uh, plots. And in fact, even if we don't change R, let's look at this. Um, if we actually take the, the three traps, which are at the sites um, coded in, in, in red, remove those three traps, what happens? Well, L max is still exactly the same. And so S is going to be exactly the same, but we've only got three traps. So when we run those three traps for, for three or four days, we're going to get half the number of flies that we've got if we'd run all six of them. So NC is going to change. So as before, when with the, the when we had one trap per site, here what we see is as increase S increases the square of R, but NE doesn't change. So DE uh, decreases, and so does DC, uh, and again giving the illusion of uh, negative density dependent dispersal when we put it into the uh, formula for calculating delta. Now it can actually get worse because at least in one of the uh, situations that Demeyer and I looked at, 
they had seven different sites and uh, they analyzed this situation as if there was one trap at each of the sites. And what they found was that the, uh, the, the smallest distance between the two sites, the two nearest sites to each other, was seven kilometers. And you can use, though, if you've only got one trap per site, um, you can use that using their first definition of how you calculate S uh, to come up with a value of around about 35 square kilometers. But actually, when you look at the original uh, study that they used, it turns out that there wasn't just one trap per site. There were two traps per site, and they were at 100 meters apart. So really, Demay said Al should have been using their second definition to calculate S. And if they'd done that, they would have come up with a value of S of 0 0.03 kilometers squared. And the difference between that and, point, uh, and 35 kilometers squared is a factor of, a, of greater than 1,000. And what that means is that the resulting values of delta differ by a factor of around about 33. Now, one could object that the two estimates, um, because we're, we're using the definition of, the, uh, of S uh, on the basis of either two traps per site or one trap per site, that these actually refer to two different subpopulations. But what you need to bear in mind is that the value of delta that Demeyer said, I'll quote, is a value which is supposed to be constant across the entire region that they were studying of seven different sites. And what you were saying, if you were saying that these are two different subpopulations, what you would be forced to conclude is that the value of delta could differ by orders of magnitude between subpopulations of the sub same, same population, depending on how traps are deployed and how S is calculated from those tra trap deployments. And so either scenario actually undermines the whole basis of the Demeyer et al. analysis. So let's look at the summary. Let's go back and remind ourselves what we uh, have on the Demeyer et al. graphs. So here's the graph if we use the effective population density on the x-axis, and here's the graph if we use the census population density on the x-axis. And what we've seen is that both of these, uh, both DE and, and DC, are hopelessly compromised. So uh, it, it may appear that the high correlations between rates of, of uh, delta and measures of effective and census population density are consistent with the idea of negative density dependent dispersal. But in fact, there is no causation in either direction and not even any confounding. The correlation and even the slope of the correlations are artifacts resulting from a failure to understand the relationship between catches of SETI from traps and actual population numbers and densities. Now then, just as an afterthought, a greater scientist than all of us had this to say about his qualities as a scientist. All I have is the stubbornness of a mule. No, it's not quite all. I also have a nose. And it was Albert Einstein who said that. <clears throat> and in science, we may not be Albert Einstein, but we all need a nose to sniff out when something is right or something is wrong. And we need his stubbornness to follow that scent to its logical conclusion, no matter what it takes and how long it takes you. Thanks very much. Here are the references. Uh, this is the Damas article. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the studies that they used. This is the study, um, the theoretical study of Rousset published in 1997, which they use as their basis for, for their studies. And what I do need to absolutely emphasize is that there is no criticism implied in this lecture at all of the study of Rousset. It was the way in which that study was used. And it was also no uh, uh, criticism implied of the study of Piero et al, or indeed any of the other studies. It's not about this, those studies. It's the way in which those data were interpreted, which is a problem. And uh, we have written this up. It is being submitted for publication. Lord knows if it will be published and if, if so, when, but you can keep an eye out open for that. Thank you very much.